Hello and welcome to Acme's YouTube channel. My name's Kate for K and today I'm talking to creative director Neil Huxley about his career pathway. Neil started as a motion graphics designer, then went on to art direction, visual effects direction, and he's now on the precipice of directing his first feature film. So hey Neil, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for being with us. Um, to look, you, Kate. You've had a great career. It's taken you all over the world. Um, you started in the UK, Australia, USA, and now the U Ukraine, and I'm sure other countries. But can we just start at the beginning and uh, tell us, how did you come to a creative career? And did you sort of wake up when you were 16 and know exactly what you wanted to do and, and how to do it? Um, no, I mean, look, I think, I think I've always been lucky in that I've been surrounded by art, you know, whether it's been my father who worked at the Tate Gallery um, and would bring home art books and catalogues of the various exhibitions that were on at the Tate, to one of my best friends ran the biggest comic shop in the world at that time in London called Forbidden Planet. So, you know, I would go over to his house and, and play video games with the likes of Simon Bisley and Frank Miller and, you know, Chris Claremont. I mean, like comic gods, comic book royalty, you know, and still are, to be perfectly honest. I mean, that I was always very lucky in that I was surrounded by that and I knew that my, my, my career trajectory was going to end me, land me in that, zone somewhere you know and it was just a question of I mean look I remember watching Terminator at the age of 10 which I probably shouldn't have been doing and I knew then that I wanted to be in the film industry in some way shape or form you know I, and I remember doing work experience at Jim Henson's Creature Shop at one point making Muppets you know because I had a love for practical effects, even at that age, you know, um, which is kind of ironic that I ended up doing so much visual effects and digital effects. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, look, I think having all of that inspiration at such an early age, it was, uh, it was, it was, it helped me a lot. Mm. Let's put it that way. And how would you describe the job that you do? Um, well, I'm a commercial director, but I also work in video games. Um, you know, I've written a movie with my brother that I'm trying to get made right now. So it's kind of like, yes, I make my living through commercial directing, but I think a lot of commercial directors want to get more into long form. Commercials are great. They're good fun. They're like making lots and lots and lots of short films but you want to get into long form. I mean, that's at least where my, my passion is really is telling stories that are longer than 60 seconds or longer than 90 seconds, you know, um, something where you really get a chance to develop characters and stories. So, so my job, you know, on paper is a commercial director. Um, but you know, I didn't really understand what directing was until I started doing it, to be perfectly honest, you know. So that brings me to my next question. How did you make the leap between um, motion graphics design to art directing and then finally directing? Yeah, I mean, I think having... It was always a means to an end for me, so I think that was important to know that all these stepping stones that I was taking at the time were leading me to a ultimate goal um so i mean i even remember working at allura and knowing that i wanted to direct at some point you know and that all of this experience and knowledge i was gaining was only going to help me be a better director you know so making those transitions i think for me at least meant leaving my country of origin which was the uk you know, because get, trying to get into the film industry in London at that time was, I mean, it was, it was, it felt like an impossible task. Lots and lots of people telling me I had to go make tea and coffee in production houses and be a runner. And, and I'm like, I've got a student loan to pay off, you know, like I need a job. So I remember moving to Melbourne and that's when my career took 
that that next step, which was ultimately working at Allura and getting sponsored and getting great experience there from, from the ground up, from rotoscoping and paint all the way through to flame and VFX design and, and then title design. And then I felt like I'd reached, I've, I remember, I always remember these points distinctly in my life where I feel like I reach a brick, bit of a brick wall and that no matter what way I turn, I'm never ever going to get over or through that wall. So then I look overseas to see if that is going to help me, you know, for me, I'll be honest, you know, Melbourne, I, I sort of, there's a little bit of a glass ceiling there. And I felt like people, um, they, they love you to stay in your, your zone, you know, like you're good at this. So stay there, you know, like mm. be happy mm. with that. And I'm never happy with that, you know? So the next logical step for me was moving to Hollywood. I mean, it's, you go to the Mecca, you know, of, of where it all happens. And, and I remember the first week, I remember having an, a week of interviews and then I got a few job offers and then I took a job um, working at a title design house in Hollywood. And the first gig, I rem remember showing up for work and the creative director asking me if I knew what the watchman was, you know, I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> we kind of, you know, I know, <laughs> I know one of the artists, you know, Dave Gibbons, it, it's kind of like one of those seminal pieces of, of comic art that changed my life. You know, it was when comics grew up and dealt with, you know, real political issues. So, mm. um, so that was kind of like a schoolboy dream come true to work on a job like that with Zack Snyder and, you know, the team that we had uh, at the time. So, so on Watchmen, um, I was um, art directing the opening title sequence. Um, that was, I was the creative art director, if you want to say on, on that. So um, that, that really, again, was one of those projects that was a big stepping stone for me from there. I remember there, there's a there's a whole backstory to how I ended up on Avatar. I was a uh, motion graphics art director on that job. It was um, it was one of those serendipitous situations again, where a friend, a new friend of mine in LA, um, got the opportunity to bid on a bunch of shots, a bunch of work on that show. And uh, they were a traditional VFX house and they had no design work. So they reached out to me and wondered if they could use some of my reel to secure that job, which they did. And then, and then basically that was my in. So I quit the job that I was on, bounced to Avatar. You know, it, it was, it was, it was a, if I look back, it was a, it was a very exciting time, you know, and, um, Again, it was, I think LA is one of those places where I, I almost felt immediately that there was no ceiling here. It's a place where if you, if you, have, um, if you have a modicum of talent and you're, you're willing to push, push, push and push, people will let you go for it, you know? Um, and, and I really do feel like LA is... is, is that's really when my career took off was coming here and being exposed to this type of work, working with these types of teams. Um, it, it definitely was, it definitely was a, a good move, you know? Mm. So do you still work on the tools um, when you're directing? Like are you working in after effects and things like that? No, I, I, I'll be honest. I was never a fan of being on the box. It was, um, it, I always felt like again it was it was it was a means to an end for me. I think my strengths my strengths are in writing and directing. They always have been. It's always been I've always been better at looking at the bigger picture of a job as opposed to be working on the same shot for six months, which, you know, um there are some amazing artists out there, crafts craftsmen and women that do fantastic work in VFX and they, they, they enjoy it with a passion. I just never had that. 
Mm. I'll be honest, you know, like I, I enjoyed parts of the job. Um, but for me, it was always, I, you know, look, I've been on the receiving end of working on shows where you're just looking at, you're fixing people's mistakes a lot of the time in VFX, you know, like. They're fixing yeah, it in post. You know, I've, I, that's, that's one, of, that's another reason why I've always wanted to get into, yeah, into directing is because I've always felt like I've, I've got a voice. I've got something to say. Um, you know, like I say, whether people like that or hate it, at least you have a voice, you know? So when you first started in LA and you were sort of at your, I mean, yeah, we've, we've heard about those initial experiences and then you went into a sort of a commercial, um, uh, agency, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, what, I know you said you sort of started off with pictures. Can you just talk a little bit about that experience when you were sort of the new kid on the block? And how that went for you? Yeah, well, that was off the back of Avatar. I that really was the pinnacle for me, working with one of my creative idols, James Cameron. You know, like again, going back to watching that Terminator at the age of ten. You know, it was very surreal. Coming off the back of Avatar, I felt like I'd reached the pinnacle of of that uh, of my interest in that particular field. Um, I, I remember working on movie, a couple of movies after Avatar and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't the same. It wasn't an event. You know, I remember when we were all working on that movie, how excited we were for it. And I just, I never, I couldn't, I wasn't getting that repeat experience. So I felt like it was time for a change again. And that's when the opportunity came up at a production company called Mothership. And Mothership was part of Digital Domain, which back then, you know, had an amazing reputation. And um, there were some really amazing artists working there. And, you know, I took, that, I took that opportunity with both hands. And it was a chance to work on their, uh, with their, director, uh, their roster of directors as what they called the pitch bitch, right? <laughs> which was... Someone that could string a sentence together, which again, I thank my father for. Um, it may not sound like I speak the Queen's English, but <laughs> you know, it, 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 I, I'm, I can write a good treatment, you know, and that was a great experience for me being in a production company where directors were, would give you their verbal responses to, pit, to briefs that then I would have to go away and flesh out into a 10, 12 page treatment with visuals and, you know, and ideas and thoughts. And then I would give that to the director and the director would give me notes. And there was this back and forth and it was really exciting. You know, like they just won an Oscar for Benjamin Buttons as well. So, wow. you know, yeah. I felt like I was in a, you know, like a major player VFX house at that time, which was 2000, 2010. Mm. I think that was when I started there. And again, in the back of my mind, it was always like, this is a means to an end, you know, like there's going to be a job. I know there's going to be a job that's going to come up that no one's going to want to do. It always happens, you know, <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm going to be the guy that's going to get asked. And that, and that came along, you know, and it was to do uh, a video game cinematic for Ghost Recon. And no one else was really interested in doing it. And the, EP at the time was a guy called Rich Flyer, who's a very, very dear friend of mine now. Um, and his, he couldn't get anyone to pitch on it either. And I was like, yeah, 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 you know, and so, so we, we rocked it, you know, and we won the job and I got to direct my first thing, which was, uh, was very exciting because we had our own mocap stage at the time was Robert Zemeckis' old building that he moved out of. So we had uh, a huge performance capture stage with virtual camera. Um, and, you know, they were, it was just awesome. So that's, that was the first job. And then that rolled into another video game spot, and another video game spot. And because I'm a huge gamer, you know, it, it all made sense to me. And when we would pitch these treatments to these developers they really appreciated that i played games you know i understood implicitly what they were trying to sell you know it wasn't like i was just coming along a director just interested in my own take on something it was like 
oh no, I've played this game or I've played the previous game. And so it was, it, it felt like a really natural fit. Um, and then obviously from doing like full CG motion capture projects, I started to then move into more live action centered work, which was again, I knew I was going to get a chance to do that at some point. And there was always that drive. Um, and, and really the first jobs where I started to get that opportunity was with the UFC, um, which again, coming from a bit of a rough part of London and having boxed and having been involved in MMA, I'm sitting down with Dana White in Vegas, you know, at UFC headquarters at this point. We're talking about my favorite fights. We're not even talking about the job that I'm pitching on. We're like geeking out over his company, you know. So it was almost like, you know, uh, he didn't really care what my ideas were. It was like, <laughs> yeah, that, that guy. Him, he's probably him. getting Well, he's probably getting a lot of agencies come in that pretend. Mm. And, and he told me, he's like, we've had everyone in here try and pitch on this work. He's like, I can see, and Dana's no fool. We could see through him in a heartbeat that, you know, if you're not, you're either a fan of the UFC or you're not, you know, like you either understand MMA or you don't, you know, and, and again, it was just, it was interesting. A lot of my past that I thought at the time was completely unrelated to what I do for a living was all coming back and making sense those boxing classes that I had or that MMA classes that I had and all of those big box VHSs that me and my brother watched as kids of these dudes beating the absolute crap out of each other, you know? Yeah. And um, it was like, yeah, it all started to make sense. It was really quite funny. So, so yeah, so that was then the live action work started mm. blowing. Mm. Um, so you obviously have great creative and technical ability, um, but I guess I'm interested to know what sort of personal qualities do you think are really important to your work? I think having a voice, you know, and it's not something that you're going to develop immediately. That's something that took me a while, but it was always instinctual for me. I never, I always thought that if I trusted my gut, it would never lead me wrong. And I'm like, touch wood, it hasn't, you know. Um, what about working, you know, I guess with agencies um, as a director or um, if you're at an agency working with a, with a director who is above you if, you, if you're not quite at that point, mm -hmm. um, what sort of qualities, like obviously they're not always going to wholesale buy, buy your vision. Mm -hmm. So I guess what, what kind of other qualities and you're always working with a big team and things like that do you draw on most frequently and have you really had to hone? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, at first you don't... <sighs> I, I would watch, I would watch directors get really upset over stuff. And I always knew that I didn't want to approach the job in that way. I think there's a tendency for, for directors to think when they're getting hired for something that the project is theirs and it's not, it's ultimately the client who's paying for it. So you are really providing a service, even though they are hiring you for, your expertise and your vision, there's a real art to getting your own way, which I would learn again off of. So I would learn bad. I, I would, I would see the bad habits that some directors would have and knew that I didn't want those. And then I would see the, 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 the way that some directors would play the political game really, really well in a room full of like 15 agency creatives, they, they, these directors would make their ideas come out of the agency's mouths. <laughs> the fine which art, is the of real art planting your ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. It's like, who cares where it came from? The idea, as long as you get, you know, as long as you get to your vision up there on screen and it's never, ever going to be perfect. I think there's always going to be compromises. Yeah. And I think you have to learn to sort of let go of that. You, you have to learn to not be so precious. It teaches you to have really thick skin. Um, you can't take things too personally. 
that's for your own work, you know, like that's for the work that you do outside of, of that, you know, I think that's where that's important to have that outlet. I think as well, I think it really is important to do your own art, whatever that is, whether that's collaging or, you know, playing synthesizers or, you know, writing or whatever, whatever that outlet is for you is to, to have that, to have that as well. And then that helps you bend perhaps to the will of other people sometimes that are paying your wage. You've got to know when to pick your battles, I think. And that's really important. It's like, know what's important to fight for, you know, no. And, and then when you fight for it, do it in a polite, kind way. So Neil, can you tell us a little bit about how you landed the job of directing the interactive movie, Friend or Foe, Shadow of War? Sure, sure. So we were talking about glass ceilings earlier and the company that I was at, uh, at that point, I had reached that ceiling there. They'd come under new ownership. Mothership wasn't their focus anymore. And it was time for me to bounce. And I had a really good friend in the industry by the name of Robert Herman, who was running a company called Ruffian. And I'd been speaking to Robert about jumping ship from the roster that I was at to him. And we were talking about it needed, it, it, I really, it really needed to be a, a job that would enable me to bounce, right? Because I'm going from a salaried position to being freelance, which was the first time in my life I've ever been freelance, which was a little bit of a scary proposition, you know, going from, you know, knowing when your money's coming in every month to, you know, I would see it with some directors, you know, they'd go months without work. It's a very competitive industry. Mm. So we were, we were, he would send me scripts over and, you know, we would, we would be talking about, you know, we would be talking about stuff and, you know, Robert got in touch one day and he was like, right, as a seven day shoot in Ukraine sound to you. And I was like, right, well, that, that's the job that could be the, could be the one, you know, I was like, what is it? And he's like, it's a, it was a code name at the time called Kraken. Okay. Which, you know, it's a huge monster and it really did kind of encompass that job, you know, because he sent the deck, the brief over, and I opened it up and I was like, oh, wow, it's the Shadow of Mordor sequel. So like, I've played the previous game. I'd even worked on a cinematic from the previous game. So I knew, I, even before looking through this document, I knew exactly this, what this job was about. Okay, I knew the game back to front. And he, he explained to me that, we were an outside horse in this race. Okay. So there's no guarantee that I'm going to get the job. They've already, they're already in bed with another director. Okay. They've already kind of awarded it, but they're $1.5 million over budget, which means two things it need to happen. Either they go back to their client and ask for more money, which they don't want to do. Uh, or they cut creative, which they don't want to do either. So, this uh, really, really cool producer reached out to Robert and said to Robert, do you have an option for us? Do you have someone on your roster that could perhaps pitch this to the agency and, uh, and give them an option that at least is on the money? You know, it's on budget. And I did. I came up, you know, I, I mean, look, practical effects was something that I always had. Uh, you know, once I read the brief, I'm like, this is my chance to combine my love of practical effects with all of my knowledge of VFX, which is, this is again, it's, it's, it's a dream job for me, you know? Um, so that's what we did. And I, I remember we put the deck together. I called the agency and apparently the agency's response after hanging up to me were expletives and, <laughs> and the words like, how do we get rid of the director that we're currently <laughs> working with and work with Neil? Because it's clear that we've got someone here who could do this, you know, and do it, it, it and understands the job and could do it, you know, really, really well. Even though, I mean, I didn't have any jobs of the scale of this on my reel. 
Mm. No, that was the other thing. That was obviously a risk for them. You know, like they're looking at my reel. Whilst there's some good work on there, there's nothing like this. I mean, this, we're talking like, this was like f making a feature film, really. It was that kind of scale. And, um, but it was a combination of me, Robert, the, the producer, Ben Latimer. I mean, it was, it was all, everyone sort of making each other feel, feel warm and fuzzy about it. Then I had to go and pitch it to a bunch of execs at Warner Brothers, which was an interesting experience. Wow, yeah. Um, because again, someone's probably writing a check for a hell of a lot of money and they're like, who the hell's Neil Huxley? You know, yeah. like we want to meet him. Yeah. And, and Robert, my, the guy, the, my, my best mate who runs Ruffian said within, he said within 30 seconds of me speaking in the room, everyone's shoulders just relaxed. Yeah. You know, um, there was ne never any doubt in my mind that I couldn't do this. It was just a matter of convincing everybody else. So, mm. so then I had to quit the job that I was at and, and that's, that's what I did. I was, that, was, that was the other risky thing. I was pitching this whilst being employed at another company, which is an extreme breach of contract. But I tell this to everyone that I talk to, it's like, Sometimes in life, you have to take these risks. And it was yeah. a calculated risk for me. I, I mm. knew at some point I was going to leave this company anyway. And if they caught me doing this, then so be it. Um, yeah. It was just a risk I had to take and it paid off. Um, Neil, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And uh, we wish you all the best with your feature. Thank, thanks for having me. Thank you, Kate. Nice to talk to you. Take care. You too.